November 12th, 1975. Travis Walton, a 22-year-old lumberjack, awoke on the side of the highway near Herber, Arizona. He didn't know how he got there, and the last few days were mostly a haze. Cold and alone, he tried to get an idea of where he was, and began to look around at his surroundings. Almost immediately, his eyes would notice a bright light in the sky. The light itself would quickly cut out, but something that looked like a disc would remain floating in the sky. The night sky and the road below reflected off the hull of this object, as if it were a mirror. The object emitted a faint warmth, which brought some relief in the dark and cold night, when abruptly, it flew straight into the sky. It didn't make any noise, and it instantly disappeared. Travis managed to get onto his feet, but he felt weak, and had trouble keeping his balance. He noticed a stretch of highway, and began to run alongside it, hoping to reach Hebert, so that he could call someone to come pick him up, or get someone from the town to help him. Walton ran wildly down the highway and managed to reach the town. He came upon a building across from the Union 76 gas station and started to knock desperately. No one answered him. He ran across the town to a row of telephone booths and dialed the operator. He tried to connect with his sister as she was the closest to Heber in hopes that she could come and get him. However, instead, his brother-in-law would pick up the phone and Walton would yell, They brought me back. I'm here in Heber. Please get somebody to come and get me. His brother-in-law Grant and his brother Duane would then arrive in town to pick him up. They asked where he had been all this time. With this memory starting to come back to him, Travis would tell them that he had been taken. Strange, hairless creatures with big eyes had taken him. Travis noticed that it was after midnight, which meant that he was out for at least a few hours. He touched his face and noticed that his beard had grown considerably, despite him shaving in the morning. At this point, his brother Duane would turn to him and tell him that he had been missing for five days. Travis had been abducted by strange entities and had been missing for some time. Travis didn't know it yet, but his alleged experience was going to become one of the most famous alien abduction incidents in American history. Travis Walton was a 22-year-old lumberjack who was currently working under Michael Rogers as part of a seven-man logging crew in the Apache Sick Greaves National Forest near Snowflake, Arizona. Walton had a troubled past that involved drug use such as LSD and run-ins with the law. Previously, on May 5, 1971, Walton and Carl Rogers, the younger brother of Michael Rogers, had broken into the offices of the Western Molding Company to steal some company checks, with the plan to forge them and cash them in. However, he and his friend would be caught, and Walton would plead guilty to this crime, but was allowed to retract the guilty plea and have his record expunged. Trying to get on a better path, he got a job with a logging operation that was run by Michael Rogers. Michael Rogers, who was the older brother of his friend Carl. Michael was a 28-year-old struggling business owner. He had recently won a federal contract to cut down trees in a 1,277-acre area in Arizona. He had won the contract by significantly undercutting the competition, a move that he would soon regret. The contract stipulated that the job would have to be done by August 1975. Failing to meet this deadline, he would win an extension until November 10th. However, this would reduce the payment per acre of trees cut down to $26 per acre from the original amount of $27 per acre. In addition, the federal government was withholding 10% of all payments until the job was fully completed. All this would only worsen Michael's financial situation. On October 16th, their operation was visited by a government inspector who concluded that there wasn't any possibility that the job would be completed by November 10th. Failure to complete the job would result in large fines and Michael would be banned from bidding on future contracts, a certain death sentence for any company operating in the area. On October 20th, Michael wrote a letter to the Forestry Service in which he offered excuses for their lack of progress but promised that his crew would finish the job unless they were asked to stop. With the deadline approaching, Michael's company and Travis's job were on the line. The only thing that could save them now was an act of God. Interestingly, the federal contract had a clause for such acts. If an operation could not be completed due to something that was clearly out of the control of the contractors, such as natural events, they could be freed from their obligations and not face any punishment. While Michael was busy dealing with the government, Travis on the same day would watch an interesting TV special that would air on NBC. A special that would catch the attention of Travis Walton. A special called The UFO Incident, starring James Earl Jones. It tells the story of another famous UFO incident involving Barney Hill and his wife. Travis and his entire family had always been UFO buffs and intrigued by these types of stories. His older brother Dwayne had even claimed to have seen a UFO himself in the area and Travis even told his mother once to not worry if he was abducted by aliens as he would return safe and sound. Two weeks later on November 5th 1975 the seven-man logging team was hard at work. With five days until the deadline 
The finish line was nowhere to be seen. With night approaching and temperatures falling, Michael decided to call it a night and head home. The crew loaded up their chainsaws into Michael's pickup truck and hit the dirt road. As they were driving down the road, the men in the truck would notice a light coming through the trees. When they got a little further down the road, they would notice something that neither of them had ever seen before. Some sort of a disc, object floating in the sky making almost no noise. It was 90 feet away and very clear and unmistakable. They stopped the truck and Walton got out to get a closer look. Walking towards the light, his co-workers back in the truck would yell at him to get back. Getting closer, the UFO would start to move and begin to emit a loud sound. Walton, now scared and unsure of what was happening, would try to retreat to the truck, but before he could get far, the light would move and point itself directly at Walton. With a loud explosion, the light would blast Walton 10 feet away with him striking himself against the ground. Now limp and completely unresponsive, his friends in the truck, struck with fear, would flee. While driving down the road, Michael would regain his confidence and decide to go back for Walton, but when they arrived back at the scene, both Walton and the alleged UFO were gone. Travis would not be seen for another 5 days and 6 hours. Most of this time would be quite a blank according to Travis himself. According to him, he remembered waking up on the craft, lying on some sort of an elevated platform. There was a bright light on top of him and strange hairless creatures with big eyes surrounding him. He remembers them being about 4 or 5 feet tall and quite silent. Travis states that he began to panic and became hysterical and fought with the aliens and pushed them away. Eventually, another being that looked like a human with some sort of a helmet on would enter the room and lead Travis into another room. Here, three humans would put a clear plastic mask over his face which would lead Travis to lose consciousness and not regain it until he was at the side of the highway. It seems that they decided to give him some sort of an anesthetic. But while Travis was supposedly getting an out of this world experience aboard the spacecraft, what was happening back on the earth? Well, some sort of a media circus and other strange events would ensue. November 5th, 7.45pm, Michael decided to call the local sheriff, Marlon Gillespie of Navajo County, two hours after the abduction had occurred. Why they waited this long, we can only speculate. Perhaps they were too shaken up, or perhaps they weren't sure if anyone would believe them. Regardless, the sheriff decided to help them and drove over to Heber with the undersheriff L.C. Ellison and deputy Kenneth Copeland. Arriving in Heber, they would find the logging crew in a sense of shock and worry. When the officers asked them to accompany them to the scene of the disappearance, only Michael and two other workers decided to join them, with three other members of the logging team deciding to just leave and go home. Arriving at the site of the abduction, they would find nothing. No trace of Travis or any evidence of the UFO ever being there. There were no burns or damage caused by the explosion from the blue beam found at the site. Around midnight, Sheriff Marlin would pause the search and decide to continue their effort in the morning. Warmer temperatures, daylight, and additional volunteers could make the search much more effective. 1.30 a.m. Michael and Deputy Kenneth Copeland drove over to Travis's mother to tell her about her missing son. Deputy Copeland had always dreaded this part of the job as it was always hard to witness the sorrow and tears of others. When they arrived at their door, Michael would deliver the news to her and what would happen next would shock the deputy, but not how you might think. Upon hearing the news of her missing son, his mother would say, well, that's the way these things happen. His mother didn't seem too concerned about the disappearance and almost expected that her son would return. She would then tell Michael and the deputy about her sightings of UFOs and even how her other son Duane had been chased by one. She seemed as if she was more interested in the topic of UFOs rather than the disappearance of her own son. 3 a.m. Michael and the deputy would drive her into town to make a phone call as she had no phone at her home. She would call her daughter to inform her about the disappearance of Travis. The sister, also, didn't have much of a reaction and seemed to almost consider it a normal event. Again, the deputy would be shocked at how well the entire family was handling this event. No worry or tears to be found anywhere, quite different from most disappearance cases. November 7th. The sheriff would organize a much larger search party. With 50 volunteers, including Travis's mother and Michael Rogers, they would scour the area known as Turkey Springs. However, soon, Travis's mother would tell the sheriff that there wasn't any point in continuing the search, as she didn't believe that her son was still on the earth. The sheriff would eventually dismiss the search party, but would continue it again when Michael and Duane complained about it ending. The sheriff would reassemble a new team of volunteers, which would include a search helicopter this time. But again, no traces of Travis or the UFO would be discovered. November 8th. The media had picked up the story, and the abduction would become an international sensation, with the reporters from the United States, Canada, and the United Kingdom covering the story. Michael Rogers and Duane would be interviewed by a UFO interest group based out of Phoenix. During the interview, both Michael and Duane expressed very little worry about Travis, 
It felt very certain that Travis would return. Michael Rogers would actually express more worry about the forestry contract that he had with the government. Rogers would comment that they were very behind schedule, explaining how it wouldn't be done due to them being preoccupied with the abduction situation. He hoped that the government would take that into account when the deadline hit. As I said before, the contract had an act of God clause that would allow companies to get away with not meeting the obligations of the contract if something natural outside of the company's control occurred. Michael hoped that an alien abduction would qualify. Dwayne himself seemed more interested in talking about UFOs during the interview. He mentioned that he had agreed with Travis and his mother that if either of them ever witnessed a UFO, they would directly go under the UFO in hopes of going on board. Dwayne, like his mother, believed that Travis was no longer on this earth, instead he had been taken. November 9th. The search would continue, but again, Travis's mother would tell the sheriff to discontinue the search as there was no point to it. November 11th. Travis's mother would be interviewed by reporters and she would again state that it would be useless to continue the search for her son. And then finally, on November 12th, Walton would wake up on the side of the road and stumble into Heber, Arizona, and tell his brother-in-law to come pick him up. Travis had been found, but the mystery behind his disappearance wasn't over yet. When Dwayne picked up his brother, he would take him down to Phoenix, Arizona to get medical attention. However, he would not notify the police that his brother had been found, but the police would actually find out on their own. When Travis made the clutch call in Heber, he would talk to the operator who recognized his name. The operator herself would notify the local sheriff's department. In Phoenix, while Travis was being examined by the doctors, they would find no signs of starvation or even all that much malnutrition. He had no physical injuries despite being thrown 10 feet and hitting the ground limp. However, the doctors would note that Travis seemed very confused, similar to other drug addicts that the doctor had seen before. The doctor also noted that Travis had a small mark on his elbow, which was consistent with needle, a sign that a needle or something else had been used. Again, I did say before that Travis had a history of drug use. It is possible that perhaps he had been hiding off somewhere and just taking drugs, but it's also possible that these needles may have been from the aliens themselves while they were examining him aboard the ship. When they arrived back in their home, Dwayne actually called for two other doctors to make a house call, two other doctors who also happened to be UFO buffs. Dwayne would forbid the doctors from using any sort of recording devices and forbade them from asking Travis any questions about his experience. Eventually, the news of his return would break and many reporters would try to get into contact with Travis to hear his story. Sheriff Marlin himself would eventually be alerted by Dwayne and would demand to speak directly with Travis. But again, Dwayne would ask that the interaction between Travis and the sheriff not be recorded in any way whatsoever. When talking to Travis, Travis would keep his story pretty short, saying that for most of the time, he was unconscious and only had a few memories of the entire ordeal. Dwayne, for some reason, had decided to maintain a lot of secrecy around his brother and his story. Not 100% sure why, but maybe Dwayne wanted to share this news for, well, maybe people that might be willing to pay a little bit more for it. In fact, a few days later, when they decided to go public, they would actually receive $5,000 from the National Enquirer, who labeled their story as the best UFO case for the entire year. The Enquirer also claimed that they actually had polygraph tests done on Travis and all the other six witnesses that were part of the logging crew and said that everyone passed the test. Another polygraph test would be taken later on, but this time only five of them would pass, with the sixth one being considered inconclusive. There would be one polygraph test that Travis would actually fail, and the polygraph tester would actually claim that Travis was controlling his breathing patterns to alter the test results. A few years later, Travis would also go on to write a book about his whole entire experience called The Walton Experience. Quite a good title, of course. And a few decades later, would even have a movie called Fire in the Sky produced and released in 1993. Walton himself would become one of the biggest sources of interest in the entire UFO community, being constantly called to different conferences, events, to speak and share his story. Also, conveniently, that contract with the Forestry Service and the federal government, it would be cancelled about two or three weeks after this entire event, and Michael Rogers would escape the contract without any major repercussions. It seems that everyone that was involved in this event got something out of it. Michael's got out of his contract with the federal government and Walton managed to make an entire living writing books, having a movie produced, and making money appearing on different sorts of UFO events. But of course, many skeptics came forward and claimed that this was a hoax for the Waltons to financially benefit. Famous UFO specialists and debunkers such as Philip Glass have pointed out that no evidence has ever been presented of this abduction and all witnesses are directly connected with Walton, which might make them a little bit biased to his story, as many of those witnesses themselves have financially benefited. Glass has stated that the medical examiners found no injuries on Walton despite him being thrown 10 feet away after the blue light exploded on him. In addition, the fact that his family wasn't worried at all and felt fully confident that he would return also seems to be 
being very suspicious. Again, it does raise the question, how did his family know that he was going to be perfectly fine if this abduction itself was legitimate? In addition, the police actually inspected the site where this UFO incident occurred, and they found absolutely no evidence of any burn marks or possible fires or even anything being blasted away when the UFO lifted off. It's also a strange coincidence that this just happened to happen two weeks after a famous UFO special by NBC aired, and also around the time that Michael Rogers needed an excuse to get out of his forestry contract. Also, the Walton family has a long history of fascination with the UFOs. All these items combined together have led many to believe that this is just a hoax, which Walton and his friends created in order to benefit off of it personally. So in this final section, I kind of wanted to give you guys an idea of what I think. Personally, I think this was definitely a hoax. The fact that the family wasn't even worried and they were acting so strangely about this entire event. The fact that Walton suffered no injuries or marks even though he flew 10 feet into the air after being exploded on by some blue light. All this is just quite strange. In addition, like I said before, both Walton and Michael had a financial incentive. And of course, at this point, they have no reason to take it back. Another thing to take into account is that Walton actually has a history of, uh, well, fraud. Especially as he tried to defraud the bank when he stole those checks earlier on, for one which he actually pled guilty. Also, as I said before, Walton actually failed some polygraph tests. And like I said, in one of the tests, he was accused of actually changing his breathing patterns in order to alter the results. So I strongly believe that this was definitely a hoax. A hoax that was inspired by Walton's fascination with UFOs and the special that aired about two weeks before this event. A special that Walton himself has admitted that he watched. I think it was also done for the financial benefit. Both Michael and Walton might have conspired together to tell this story. But again, that's just my opinion. And again, Travis wasn't the first person in his family to have a UFO story. His brother Dwayne had actually said that he had been chased by a UFO before. But again, that's just my opinion. Let me know what you guys think down below. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, and comment below. And let me know what you thought. This was definitely an interesting story to cover. And I definitely liked making this video a lot. So that's really all that there is to it. I'll see you guys later.